Welcome to part 2. If you haven't already watched part 1, go watch it now so you can get caught up to know what supplies are required. In this video, you'll see a monster mud technique to create a mold that doesn't damage the item. Now you can reuse the prop in a scene or somewhere else in your haunt, saving you at least $30 in the case of a 5 foot skeleton. That's right, for a limited time only, you'll get two for the price of one. Well, kind of. Let's get started. First, prep the skeleton by removing the tags or strings that may show in the final mold. Decide on what position you want the skeleton in, keeping in mind if you want to remove it from the mold, it is best to keep it close to the foam. I wanted the hands to be at the skeleton's sides so it was more visible in the mold. In order to do this, I opened the arm socket by removing the screws on the arm, then I put the piece on the back without screwing the screws in all the way back in, and loosely fit the arm back on the socket so it was more to the side. You can use a bead of hot glue to hold the skeleton's jaw in any position, depending on the look you're going for. If you want to change the jaw position at a later date, simply open or close the jaw to break the hot glue's bond. I placed two layers of painter's tarps to make the mold easy to open. I tucked the first layer around the skeleton. To save money on materials, you could simply use trash bags. Yes, this technique can be used to make a mold that doesn't damage the item, but no, you cannot mold a live person. Well, at least not one you're fond of. Running a heat gun over the plastic causes it to shrink around the skeleton, which will make the monster mud application easier and help to give it the look of carved stone. It helps to press the plastic into position before running the heat gun onto that area. If you burn a hole in the plastic, simply cover it with a piece of tape. I recommend wearing gloves, old clothes, and putting a tarp down. Masonry paint provides waterproofing and a gritty texture. Exterior latex paint also provides waterproofing and has a smooth texture. Mixing the joint compound can be done with a paint stirring stick. A mixing bit aerates the mix using a power tool, but you worked hard for that money, so save it by skipping this purchase. You don't need to mix the masonry or latex paint into the joint compound, you can easily apply it after. If you choose to, the ratio is 5 parts joint compound to 1 part masonry or latex paint. Each cup was about 18 ounces. You can make monster mud with the entire amount of joint compound at once since you can store it in the closed joint compound container. You can also thin joint compound and latex paint with water for an easier application. Use any bucket or plastic bin available for combining the monster mud and fabric. If you rinse the bucket or bin while the monster mud is still wet, it can be cleaned, but it gets harder once it dries. Warning: Do not rinse this in a sink. The monster mud can clog your drains. Add the fabric to the bucket or bin and work the monster mud onto the fabric. I filled up the cup 5 times in total, which is about 90 ounces. Grip the fabric with a tight fist and pull the fabric through your fist with your other hand. This will remove the excess monster mud from the fabric. It's okay if the fabric still shows slightly, but it is best to have an even coat. Find the center at one end of the fabric and begin to drape it over the skeleton centered at one end. From the center out, press the fabric around the skeleton to achieve the look you desire. If you want to be able to remove the skeleton or object being molded, make sure you don't conform the fabric past the sides. If you press the fabric past the point and around the back of the skeleton, you may not be able to remove it from the mold. And now a message from my younger self. Every time the like button is flashed, a hunter gets their screams. Monster Mug must be applied in multiple thin coats. This reduces the required drying time and reduces cracking. Single layers of fabric with Monster Mug will dry within 24 hours. Multiple layers, especially where the fabric is bunched up, will take a minimum of 48 hours but can be longer. At this point, I used 3 quarters of the joint compound and masonry paint. Once the first coat is dry, pull down on the plastic to break it free from the mold. Do this around the edges. Pry the mold open. You can also place it upside down on the ground and pull out the foam and skeleton. You can see that just a thin layer of monster mud holds the shape but is still flexible. I 
I tested a can of window and door expanding foam to fill the mold. I also added scrap pieces of foam to save on materials. The scraps, or fill material, are simply used to decrease the volume of expanding foam required. If used, this step reduces the amount of expanding foam required. It is important not to overfill the mold. The foam expands once sprayed. One can was not enough to fill the mold. I recommend saving money on that purchase and using packing material that arrived in boxes. Place the mold back on the foam panel if you're using any adhesive or expanding foam so it dries in the correct position and helps glue it to the foam panel. Once dry, tin snips make it easy to cut the dried monster mud flush with the foam panel, but you can skip this purchase and get away with using scissors on the wet monster mud, especially if you didn't use masonry paint. I added hot glue around the edges to secure the mold to the foam. Applying hot glue under the folds of the fabric helps to create a flat crease. I decided to add another thin layer of monster mud. This time I mixed in latex paint and thinned it with water for an easy application. Add small amounts of water, then stir. Repeat the process until the joint compound is the consistency you desire. I mixed it until it would drip in a single stream from the mixing stick versus solid clumps. Do you remember the pro tip from part 1? While the skeleton mold is drying, I painted the foam panels. When painting props, I find it best to use the key of three. That is, use a minimum of three colors or shades to give depth to your project. First, I applied a medium gray paint, then a black wash, followed by a white dry brush application to the entire panels. First, I used gray primer spray paint to show you the technique and coverage. Pro tip, hold spray paint away from the foam and spray multiple light coats so the foam doesn't melt, unless you're wanting that look. When this video is over, take a look at my video where I show you how to spray paint foam like a pro. Pro tips. Oh yeah. The spray paint would require multiple coats and more easily flake off. I recommend using an exterior latex or masonry paint since they only require one coating. You can also sand the foam to make the surface more rough so the paint would adhere better. Be sure to wipe off the foam dust prior to painting. Keep in mind if applying masonry paint to the wood, the first coat must be thin to ensure it sticks. Instead, you can brush on a gray latex paint to the entire panels and be sure to coat the ends of the panels. Then with black latex paint, I added the water to create a wash. The purpose of a wash is to get into the cracks to create those deep shadows. While the paint is still wet, wipe it off with a rag. It helps to roll the rag so it stays on the surface of the project and doesn't remove paint from the grooves. Remember that foam carving technique when we used a screwdriver and how you can make foam look like rocks? Once dry, apply white highlights to the edges and high spots. In low lighting, you won't be able to see subtle details, so make sure the paint really pops. The dry brush technique is what it sounds like. Using a flat, dry brush that has stiff bristles, dab some paint onto the end of one side of the brush, wipe off the excess. Using light pressure, run the brush across the edge or high points of the project. If highlighting the edges, start the brush off the project and the edge is the first the brush should contact. This simulates the concentration of light. You'll want to consider where your imaginary or actual light source is coming from before starting. Keep the brush horizontal to the project so it glides across the hide spots. The best tip is to apply the paints in the lighting conditions how the prop will be displayed. So if the prop will be displayed in a black light scene, paint it under a black light. This is a step that many people miss and regret when their prop blends in with the walls. Remember in part one when I said this? Applying a technique for creating faux marble, I used acrylic paints in the following order, gray, black, and white. Paint or drizzle multiple thin lines of gray paint across an area or a single line across the entire project. Once you lay down a line with a damp cloth or sponge, dab from the center out to create a fade, blending the color into the base coat. Be sure to keep color running in the same general direction with occasional crossings and merges. You can vary the direction of each color, but generally, stone veins run in a similar direction. It also helps the mind perceive it as stone. Repeat this process until the project is covered. Now apply the black paint in the same way. You don't need to wait for the project to dry as this helps the blending of the colors. 
finally apply the white veins. Use any excess white paint on the sponge or rag to go over the gray area and black areas to tone it down. This is where the faux technique really comes together and looks like stone. I tested standard wood polyurethane as a waterproofing so you can see the results. I applied two coats, allowing 24 hours of dry time in between. I desired a polished stone look, so the addition of yellow-brown tint really helped me achieve that. It darkened up a light base coat, allowing each of the paints to show through, creating a higher contrast for my low lighting. Your project will be protected if you use masonry or exterior paint, and a clear coat is not required. Here's a secret they don't want you to know. Come closer. Closer. If you're creating old looking props and scenes, don't worry so much about protection from the elements like sun damage. Weathering that occurs in time will enhance the authenticity of your props. Pull your scene together with multiple layers, lighting, fog machine, animals, bugs, sounds, or smells. Take a look at the key of three as the lighting is lowered. You can still see the three distinct tones. This technique can also be used to create wall panels, accents for any scenes, and the popular ghosts popping from a picture frame, like the one I made in this video here. Click it and see for yourself.